The extended title of this message is The Outsider That Became an Insider. Now, you might be wondering what I'm talking about, and I'm glad to make you wonder, because God's Word makes us wonder many times. And it is through our inquiry, it is through our inquiry that we come to understand what God wants to share with us, what He wants to reveal to us in His Word. But a little bit of introduction. Uh, when we all, let me just wish everyone a happy Sabbath Thanksgiving. And I'd like to say every Sabbath is, should be a happy Thanksgiving Sabbath. Don't you think? We should. It, it is interesting, and we're going to discover this in our, in our sermon, in our message today, that this is, this is one of the interesting Christian practices or disciplines that we often overlook and neglect. Like when someone says, the Bible says, in everything give thanks. You'll see it, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you and I. How can you and I give thanks to God when the going is rough and tough? When your life is falling apart? When maybe your family or marriage is falling apart? When you have health issues that you're carrying or burdens that you're bearing? How can you give thanks? And how, what's the answer to that question? It's based on your personal experience and walk with God. Yeah? That's the only way we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. That's why Paul could heal my own from a dark, dingy dungeon in a Philippian jail and write to us, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It takes such incredible faith to believe in a God, to express gratitude when the circumstances are less than formidable. Great faith. May God give us that. So what is Thanksgiving about? It's not about turkey and cranberry and sauce. And it's not about, you know, corn stalks and it has really very little to do with that. That's secondary, actually. That's just the, that's, I like to call that the externals. The externals. But what is Thanksgiving really about? Well, let, let's discover that a little bit more. And I talked to you a little bit about these fruits and the, the principle, the history behind this Thanksgiving service and celebration was simply this. That the farmers and, and, and the planters who were God-fearing people would at the end of their bountiful harvest call family and friends together. And their first duty was to offer prayers of praise and thanksgiving to God Almighty for all the blessings that He has bestowed. His bountiful blessings, His measureless blessings, His boundless blessings. And so this is where the heritage, the history came from, this tradition as it were. So it's a good tradition. There are some traditions that are good and some that are not so good. You keep the ones that are good, especially if they have a biblical basis and foundation. So it's about remembering the goodness of God. How many times have we paused to stop and thank God for His goodness? This period. Or even just a dinner with your family, or just one occasion where today it's just we're giving thanks. I don't want to hear about problems or remember issues. I'm just focusing on giving thanks to God. You create your list. What are you thankful for? Give me, you can at least find one, and I'll ask you for your top three. But even with today's countdown, top ten, there must be ten things that you and you and I could write on a piece of paper that you're thankful to God for. Can you do it? If I were to challenge you right now to pull out a piece of paper and write ten things, could you do it? Well, this, this, this afternoon as we go to our potluck, our potluck is not just going to be eating and washing your hands and wiping your mouth and saying goodbye. Our Thanksgiving potluck today is designed to have testimonies of Thanksgiving and a time to write that list out. I'm giving you a heads up. So you're not going to be eating and running away. We're actually, I'm working with... Um, 
Sister Crystal, we're kind of merging an AY program that was going to be a standalone. Today, we're kind of integrating that into our uh, Thanksgiving fellowship lunch together. So I want you all to stay back as much as you can. If you have plans, I, I'm sorry uh, if you do have to go, but if those plans are modifiable, then please stay. If you can flex with those plans, join us here today. We'd love to have you in our fellowship. So, oh, here's the picture I wanted to show you. This is it. So it would probably be the more, uh, what do you call, experienced or veteran farmer who would call all the other farming families together. And they would be in a field. And they would gather to pray and give thanks and share what God has done for them. And then after that, they would break bread together. Beautiful. It's a beautiful experience. And so that's where the tradition comes from. So this is what's thanking about it. And my question is, how thankful are you today? Who woke you up this morning? Who started going away? There are those who went to bed last night that never got up this morning. How thankful are you today? Every day you've got to be thankful. You know what? When I find myself running into criticism and looking for uh, faults and issues and problems, the Lord rebukes me in love and reminds me that I need to stop doing that and be thankful to Him. Be thankful for what He has done in my life. Be thankful. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for... What am I thankful for? Well, I'm thankful first to God for the gift of life. I'm thankful to my God for giving more than second chances. Multiple, endless chances. I can't even begin to count them. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my church family here at Barry. I'm thankful for each one of you here because the journey is just beginning. God is going to do great things in our lives. And we need to thank Him for it already. Thank Him, thank him for it by faith. Thank Him in advance for, it, for what is already going to happen. I'm thankful to all of our children and all of our young people here. Thank you to our returning students. I saw some of the students from school. I see Zach, and I see Kamande, and we had other students. I didn't see them, but I'm sure you're back. Welcome back home. Welcome back. I'm thankful for what God is doing in our lives. I'm thankful for that He is patient, long-suffering, and He doesn't give up on us. What are you thankful for today? I want to share with you the history of Thanksgiving in Canada. And guess what? It's even longer than our U.S. neighbors. The Americans think their Thanksgiving is great. No offense to our U.S. brothers and sisters. But they think they had Thanksgiving first. No, no, no. We had Thanksgiving first. Let me give you the facts. Facts from history. It can be traced back to 1578. The voyage of Martin Frobisher from England in search of the Northwest Passage. His third voyage to the Frobisher Bay area of Baffin Island. How many of you have been there or know where it is? You know where it is? <laughs> it's really far up there in Canada, in our great geography of Canada. I'll show you a picture in a moment. Uh, in, in the present Canadian territory of Nunavut. <laughs> How many of you have been to Nunavut? You've been to Nunavut? I know we have some members of that work in... Is Nunavut? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We have some branches in Nunavut. We have some members here that work far up north, and uh, it is set out with the intention of starting a small settlement. That was his purpose. His fleet of 15 ships were outfitted with men, materials, and provisions. However, the loss of one of his ships through contact with ice, along with much of the building material, was to prevent him from doing so. The expedition was plagued by ice and freak storms which at times had scattered the fleet and on meeting together again at the anchorage in Frobisher Bay. Hence, they named that body of water that bay after Martin Frobisher. Here it is. So here you have back in island, the big island, and then of course you have on this side here, there's another bay here, and this is Frobisher Bay right here. So you're going up northern Canada, and say, Convention here, you see, and it's going way up to Nunavut. So this is very far. 
So that northwest passage would be the oriental passage where they were discovered, where they're coming over. This is the area that they found themselves. But what's interesting is that one of his fleet, members of his fleet, Maester Wolfo, a learned man appointed by Her Majesty's Council to be their minister and preacher. They had a minister and preacher on board. Did you know that? In, in most expeditions that were sent from, especially from, from the British Isles, there was appointed to the expeditioner, the leader of the expedition, a minister and a preacher, because they believed in God. They believed in Him, not only did they believe in Him, but they also would like God's protection upon them. So he then made unto them a godly sermon, exhorting them especially to be thankful to God for their strange and miraculous deliverance in those dangerous places. Yeah. Did you hear that? Did you know that? Did you know did you, you knew that already? Okay, then if you knew that already, you're you're far advanced than me. That's wonderful. They celebrated communion and the celebration of Divine mystery was the first sign, scale, and confirmation of Christ's name, death, and passion ever known in all these quarters. You trying to tell me that Canada was a godless society? No. Canada was not a one-time God-fearing nation? Yes, it was. Trying to tell me that God is not a part of the sovereignty of this nation and the blessing and the bounties of this nation? You better think again. Why Canada is so great is not because it's the second largest country, not just because it's the largest supplier of fresh water in the world, not because we have so much minerals. No, no, no. Why Canada is so great is because of the blessing of the Almighty God. Amen. And it shouldn't be taken away as society is squeezing God out Pushing God out of our history, out of the schools, out of the morals of society. Watch, watch this now. We who know the history of this country should not be ashamed. Should never be ashamed to tell our history. Because history can never be erased. History is permanently established for us to learn lessons, to guide us into the future, into the present and into the future. <laughs> for the present and into the future. Thanksgiving. Now, if you still don't believe me, let's go to Parliament. Why is it that, is it the first Monday or second Monday of every October month? Is it the second, right? The, why is every second Monday of October declared and designated as Thanksgiving? Why? Here's our history. On Thursday, January 31st, 1957, the Parliament of Canada proclaimed a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God. Who did it say? Which other God? No other God. To the Almighty God for the bountiful harvest with which Canada has been blessed to be observed on the second month. You know. Parliament. Then Prime Minister, and it was John Dinklage, I think, if I'm mistaken, 1956. Did you know that? Very clear. This is a proclamation in the statutes, statutes that if you go to the library of Parliament, you'll find it. It's there. No one changed it. No one ever dared change it. It's there for us to be educated, to be aware to be known that it was a day of general thanksgiving to Almighty God. Amen. So do we live in a Christian nation? Amen. Think again. Think about the country which we live in. God has blessed this country <laughs> because those who came here earlier brought with them their God and their presence and seek the blessing of God on them. Nobody ought to tell you otherwise. Yes, we live in a pluralistic society. Yes, we live in a country that accommodates all religions and all people. That's all right. 
because God is the God of everybody. But it is certain that God wants everybody to come to know Him. Who to know Him like So we live in a world that has had many outbreaks. One such is the Ebola virus. How many of you heard about the Ebola virus? You heard about it? And according to the World Health Organization, the Ebola virus disease, EBD, formerly known as Ebola hemorrhagic fever, is a severe, often fatal illness in humans. The virus is transmitted to the people from wild animals and spread in the human population through human-to-human -human transmission. So it is an infectious disease. It's contagious. The average EBD case fatality rate is around 50%. Case fatality rates have varied from 25 to even 90% in past outbreaks. It's very serious. And you'll see people suited up from head to toe, right? Especially if they're going into an area where EBD is rampant or where there's an outbreak. You'll see them covered in these suits. And so it's very serious. It's a virulent, virulent disease, very virulent disease. But there, there was another one in times past. It still exists today, but it has been greatly contained. There's another one. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? What is it called? There was another dreaded scourge in our Lord's day. And even recently years, recent years, but now it's been contained, but still exists. What was it? Huh? Let's say it again. I heard it. Yes. That's correct. Leprosy, also known as Hansen's disease, is a chronic infection caused by the bacteria, Mycobacterium leprae and Mycobacterium lepromatosis. Initially, infections are without symptoms and typically remain this way for five as long as 20 years. Can you believe it? Symptoms that develop include granulomas, of the nerves, respiratory tract, skin, and eyes. This may result in a lack of ability to feel pain and thus loss of parts of extremities due to repeated injuries, weakness, and poor eyesight may also be present. Have you ever seen anybody with leprosy? Yes. Have you seen pictures of leprosy? Yes. May I show you? I'm going to show you now. Don't cringe, but that is, that is a sample picture of what leprosy looks like. Yeah. Leprosy. Dreaded disease. Let's go to the text. We're going to get to the word right now. Into the word we go. If you have your Bibles, please turn it to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 17. And we'll pick it up from verses 11 through 19. Luke chapter 17. The Gospel of Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And I read from verse 11. The Bible says, while he was on, I'm reading from the King James, this might be from the Amplified. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. He was passing between these two towns. The Bible says, as he entered the village, how many leprous men? Ten leprous men who stood at a distance came to meet him. Now, the Bible says in verse 12 that in, in the text here it says that they stood afar off. Why do you think they stood afar off? Exactly. They were considered outcasts. They were considered the scourge of society. They were not only spiritually quarantined, but they were socially quarantined. In other words, they, they couldn't come to anybody except the priests. And even then, the priests had limitations. There were times when they could see the priests. And then from society, they were banished in leper colonies. Leper colonies in a neighborhood that was that was quarantined, that was courted up, nobody could go there. They had no social life, and they were dying physically. No one could say, I'm praying for you, I'm coming to give you food. They were totally outcasts, misfits. So they stood afar off. It's amazing that they got this far, although they were far off. 
because they heard Elder Jesus was passing by. What happens to a desperate soul who hears Jesus passing by? They do everything that they can to get to Jesus. And I've experienced that in my own life when things are so difficult, no one else can help me. Doctors can't help me. Counselor can't help me. The pastor can't help me. Only Jesus can help me. Yes, he is. Verse 13. The Bible says, And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Interesting, isn't it? That, that these ten lepers, all in unison, recognized who Jesus was. Not only is his name Jesus by name, but they recognized him, his title as well. Name is Jesus. But his title is Master. See, many people only recognize, recognize Jesus by name, recognize God by name, but not by title or his function in their lives. We all can use the name of Jesus. That's one. But until he becomes Master of our lives, then we never experience him in fullness. Never in fullness. So watch this now. They said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now let me tell you something about Jesus, about God. We're talking about this whole quarter, the character of God. One of the great characteristics of God is that he's mercy. That's why Jesus says, he or she that cometh to me in John 6, verse 36, John 6, chapter 6, it says, he that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. There's something about what we call on the name of Jesus. And we plead for his mercy. Something within the heart of God responds to the cry and to the call for mercy. But you must call and cry from the depths of your soul when you really mean it. It's not because you have to do it for the sake of doing it, but because you recognize your need for him. Amen. Those lepers had only one hope. They heard about Jesus. They were a write off of society. That was it. They were left to die. But they heard Jesus, the Master, the Messiah, the Rabbi. He was passing by. And all they could think is how can I get him? They had a plan. What's your plan to get to Jesus today, brothers and sisters? Do you have a plan? What's your plan? How do you plan to get to Jesus? Are you going to wait till you get leprosy? To strike your body and your soul? When are you going to get to Jesus? Verse 14 says, So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that they went and they were cleansed. Now hold on. What, what was Jesus doing here? I thought Jesus was in charge of the situation. He is. But Jesus now uses a different approach. See, here's the one thing I love about my Jesus. That you can never predict how he's going to work. You can never tell God how he should work. Because God will never work the way you want him to work, the way you expect him to work, and the way you <laughs> tell him to work. You can't advise God. He's never asked you to act in an advisory capacity. Who are we? We must be out of our minds, out of character. Because God did it this way before, doesn't mean he's going to do it the same way the next time. That's why he's God. God could have healed them instantaneously on the spot. But Jesus now, because he was always under attack, he says, I'm going to use the socially acceptable way, the conventional way. The priests were considered the gatekeepers, the doctors of the day. So Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, says, okay, I'll do what is acceptable, what is the social convention, what is the correct procedure. I'm going to send you to the priest. Because only then, in those days, 
the priest could pronounce someone free or unclean. So Jesus was not only, Jesus looked ahead, because guess what? He saw not only their physical leprosy, he saw their social disease. They were outcast. Everyone said, oh, you see that, uh, Mr. Leper X? No, no, we stay away. Children, don't go near to him. Don't go. There. He's plagued. He's cursed by God. Leprosy was considered a curse from God. Who defined that as a curse from God? Those same priests. Those same rulers. Those same church leaders. They're the ones who said leprosy was a curse from God. Wrong. So wrong. They misunderstood the character of God. They didn't even know God himself. Had they known who God is and even a glimpse of his love, they would never come to that decision. Sometimes you and I risk that same mentality. We often want to take the place of God, judge other people, criticize other people, by whose standard? Your standard is so low, so far from God. My standard is so far low from God. Let's not even go there. If you know who God is and begin to know who He is, you and I will be beside ourselves. We even open our mouths to talk about so many things. That's why Jesus had to rebuke them so many times in love. Stop looking at the moat in your brother's eye when your moat in your eye is bigger. You're so blind. We're so blind that we can't even see. So Jesus did something for them amazing. See, Jesus could have cured them. There's no doubt. Doubt? Undoubtedly, your Jesus, my Jesus, could have pronounced them clean, instantaneously, made them whole. But how would he correct the social stigma that was attached? How would they then be accepted? The only way they can be accepted is to get a piece of paper from the, the priest who says, who is the doctor, they are not uh, leprous anymore. They're clean. You can accept them back into the neighborhood, back into the community, back into the synagogue. Did you know they couldn't even come to the synagogue? Okay, did I say that? Did you hear that? You know, you didn't hear that. They could not come into the church of the day. You believe that? When church should be the place, the center of healing, of health, of hope and salvation, they couldn't even come to the doors of the church. Pity. Somebody walked into our church today. Obviously, if the disease is infectious, then we have to take measures. But generally speaking, if somebody walked into the doors of a church today, we would be first sometimes, I'm not judging, but sometimes human nature is that we would not be the first to accept them. We would not be the first to make them feel welcome. We may not be the first to move aside and let them sit beside us or even have our seats. Why? Because our understanding of God is so funny. Jesus you love Jesus. Don't you love him? He's amazing. The Bible says that as they went, they were cleansed. <laughs> they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he returned with a loud voice glorifying God. Did you hear that? Okay, hold on. How many were there to begin with? How many church? Boys and girls, how many? How many boys and girls? How many? Come on, boys and girls, how many? Ten, thank you. But the Bible says that only one, one, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a small voice. And look, no, no, it says what? With a loud voice. And glorified God. Verse 16 says, Look, look what else he did. Look what else he did, brothers and sisters. Check it out as we wrap it up here. And he fell on his face at his feet. And did what? Give him thanks. Now, 
interjected into the narrative is a new condition. And he was a Okay. Luke is a physician by profession and vocation. Luke is concerned with details. A doctor is very observant. When you go to a doctor, hopefully your doctor is observant, watching your physical and your, your emotional and all the different cues. Luke, the physician, is very detailed. He could have omitted this detail in the text. But Luke, Dr. Luke, includes it. He incorporates this important detail in the text. Why? Well, I'm so glad you asked. You ready to find out? Let's find out. In other words, that this one leper who returned to Jesus was a Samaritan, which then indicates we can conclude by deductive reasoning and logical understanding that the other nine were not Samaritans, but they were They were church members, supposedly. But the one, the one, that found it in his heart. The one, the Samaritan and Jews were not body terms, they were not closely connected, they were not knitted together. But the one, Samaritan, watch what the Bible says, so Jesus answered out. When Jesus has to ask this, 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 this grieves, this grieves, this is a grieving point. When Jesus, okay, I'm gonna come back to that, I'm gonna come back to that. The one, you see the picture of the one? Just the one. Then watch what Jesus said. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? It continues. But no one was found, the Bible says, who returned to give glory to God except Hold on, I got out of practice and we're Are you getting the picture? Mm -hmm. It took an outsider to recognize Jesus not only by name, but Jesus as Lord and Master. And when Jesus is Lord and Master, we worship him. He fell at, on his feet. And he came back and gave thanks. The other nine were ungrateful. They were unappreciated. They just had the worst disease of the then known world and humanity. And they couldn't even return to give thanks to the one who pronounced them whole. Could it be, brothers and sisters, that in our Christian experience, sometimes just like the other nine, we forget the way the Lord has led us, the way the Lord has blessed us, the way God has brought us from where God has brought us from, and we cease to give thanks and gratitude to God? Amen. Is it possible? I took a forward. When an outsider can give God more praise than an inside, you and I, we are proud. When a foreigner who never stepped a day in, the, in their life in the church can show and demonstrate with their deepest gratitude from the depth of their soul for what God has done for them. And you and I, who for years have taken it for granted, we need to check our Christianity. The real impact of the gospel will be seen when we don't feel joyful when we don't want to pray, and when we cannot think of a reason to be thankful. Please read the post that I wrote. I wrote that for you and I in mind as we go forward. I want to share a few quick closing points. Gratitude is the highest duty of the believer and the supreme virtue, the fountain from which all blessings flow. Gratitude is the highest duty of the believer, you and I. And number two, ingratitude. Ingratitude is the leprosy of the soul. It eats away on the inside, destroys our happiness, 
cripples our joy, withers our compassion, paralyzes our praise, and renders us, renders us numb to all of God's blessings. Ingratitude. Ingratitude. Let us not be, let us not be ungrateful. Let us not be ungrateful, brothers and sisters. Closing. This is what Jesus said. And I gotta go back. Wait, so I'm just gonna stay right here. Three questions Jesus is to ask. Do you think Jesus was sad? Well, he was sad. He was sad that the other night. Who should know better? They knew better. But of course, the Samaritan. And Jesus says to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has been reformed. I want to tell you something. We're all ten cleansed from leprosy. Yes? yes. All ten were cleansed. Yes. But what did the one receive that the other nine did? That one received a blessing that the other nine didn't receive. He received the privilege of fellowship with Jesus. The others should have known better. Not only did Jesus heal the nine of leprosy, including his one leper, but what the nine didn't experience was healing unto salvation. This one received a foreigner, an outsider, who became an insider. <laughs> so, what can you and I give God thanks for today as I close? And everything the Bible says. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What can you I, you and I give God thanks for? Can I give you a little list before I close and I shut down? Let me give you that list, Sarah. Let me give you that list. We can give thanks that our God is sovereign. We can give thanks that nothing in our world happens by chance without God's permission. We can give thanks that God causes all things to work together for his children, for their good. We can give thanks that hard times reveal our weakness, break our pride, and shows us our total need for God. We can give thanks that God has triumphed over sin and death through his Son, Jesus Christ. We can give thanks that God uses the worst that happens to us and in us to promote our spiritual growth. We can give thanks that God is faithful even when we are faithless. We can give thanks that God's word will be vindicated, that God's promises are true, that evil will not reign forever, Amen. that heaven is real, Amen. that this world is not our home, we're only passing through, Amen. that when we're weak, then we're strong, that His grace is sufficient for you and I in every situation, that nothing can separate you and I from the love of God Amen. through Christ Jesus our Lord, Amen. that our salvation doesn't rest on us, but rests on Him, our God. Amen. That there is no pit so deep that the love of God is not deeper still. Amen. That the blood of Jesus cleanses you and I from every sin. Amen. That God delights to save you and I as sinners. Amen. That the Lord can soften and subdue the hardest of hearts 
that there are no impossibilities with God. That even when we feel alone, we are never alone. That our Father will not test us and give us more than we're able to bear. That the Holy Spirit abides with us always. That the Lord Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That the Holy, Sp Holy Spirit prays for us through moans and groans when we cannot even utter a word from our soul. That God uses everything and wastes nothing. Amen. That someday we will be conformed into the image of Christ. That someday we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That our hardships one day will become our strength. That God's plan for us is greater than our plan for ourselves that we are still the sons and daughters and the children of the Most High, that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us. Far more exceeding and eternal weights of glory than everything. Give thanks. But this is the will of God. The Christ Jesus for us. If you want to stand your feet and give God thanks today, Stand and let's give God thanks and praise from all blessed flow. Invite our praise team to come forward. Let us sing that song as if we really mean it. Let us God to forgive us for being so ungrateful. Help us every day to find something to be thankful for and to thank God every day for who He is. Now thank ye all our God. Five, five, nine.
fellowship. This is one of the best ways that we can give thanks together to unify our church and to break bread together. We also have a, a sister who has been with us for several weeks, Sister Hamilton. I see you there in the corner. We invite you to stay with us and we have a special prayer for you later as you return back to your home country. Let's pray together. Eternal God of grace and glory, we thank you for who you are. The God who never fails. The God who is constant, the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. We place our lives into your unchanging hands. May you keep us faithful and true to you. May we, O oh Lord, ever have a song of praise and thanksgiving in our hearts and upon our lips. Bless everyone here. Bless every family, every visiting friend, Lord. May today not be the same way we came in, but help us to never forget from this day forward our responsibility and Christian duty. To express each day of our heartfelt gratitude to a God who deserves our highest praise. Amen. Now I ask that you'll raise your right hand for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. With thanksgiving we pray that every child of God say, Amen. Amen. We look forward to seeing you downstairs for our fellowship.